Okay, so we can get started now. All right, so today's speaker is Keith Matera. He's been at Fermilab uh, as a research associate in NOVA since August of 2014. He was born in Long Island on January 11th, and he went to college at Bo Bowdoin College in Maine, where he graduated magna cum laude, whoop, whoopsie doo. Then he um, taught for a while at Canterbury High School in Connecticut. He taught physics, chemistry, and computer science, and did a lot of other things like coach cross country, track and field, swimming, baseball, and he was a dorm parent. Then he got his PhD at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, in physics, and um, came to Fermilab just after that. Um, so his birthday, January 11th, is kind of cool because um, we had a visit from Italian Prime Minister Matteo Renzi earlier this year, and that's his birthday too. And um, even more important is it, it's the birthday of Albert Hoffman, the inventor of LSD. So I think <laughs> they've. <laughs> <laughs> so um, um, let's see. Um, Keith says when he was teaching at Canterbury, the dean of faculty told him that he needed to put travel goals on his school profile after explaining fruitlessly to her that it was perfectly content right where he was. After a 15 second Google search, he said pilgrimage to Fermilab and called it a day. So he had no idea that that was where he was going to end up, but well, here he is. Serendipity has, has come. So Keith Matera. Thanks, Elliot. Can you all hear me all right through the mic? Sounds good? All right, excellent. So thank you all for coming today. I'm going to be speaking with you about the legend of the neutrino mass ordering and the neutrino and knot. And if you're not familiar with the parable that I'm referencing over here, a Gordian knot is a seemingly intractable problem that can be solved with some kind of loophole. In the case of the actual myth, Alexander the Great just cut it in half with a sword, then found both ends and untangled it that way, <laughs> which is not quite as elegant as the solution I'm going to be proposing, because ours is more elegant. But first, since your last talk concerning neutrinos was about a month ago, I'm going to start by reviewing a little bit about neutrino physics. First of all, this is the map with which we're going to set off over here. This is the standard model of particle physics. And uh, this is supposed to contain all of the particles that make up matter and all the forces that mediate interactions between them. So you're looking at the left over here, quarks and leptons. Those are the particles that make up matter. And the force carriers that will keep them bound together in states like nuclei or like atoms and would allow them to interact with one another, such as through chemical interactions or nuclear interactions. And for every particle, there is a corresponding antiparticle, though, as a disclaimer, some of these particles are, their, are the same as their antiparticles. For example, the photon is its own antiparticle. But for most of what you encounter day to day, you're actually only dealing with a very small subset of the standard model. The up quark and down quark, the electron, the photon, and the gluon. The rest are all around you, but they're really not things that you interact with normally. So why is this? The up and down quarks are what combine to give us protons and neutrons. You have two up quarks and a down quark, that'll give you a proton, and two down quarks and an up quark will give you a neutron. And what they're held together with is the gluon, which is the force carrier for the strong force. So when you talk about a proton, what it really is is these two up quarks and a down quark bound together by the exchange of gluons. Now it keeps them in a constant state. And again, with the neutron, gluons are what keep things contained within there. And the strong force is, as its name might imply, extremely strong. Um, and uh, there's actually some residual strong force left over, even after these quarks are bound into nucleons, to give you multi-proton and neutron states, aka nuclei, where you have neutrons and protons all bound together. So the leftover force from the strong force leaks out and allows positively charged protons to be held together with neutrons inside of the nucleus. And as again, just tantamount to how strong the strong force is, it's this residual force that's released in the, an atomic bomb explosion. Um, so it's just an insanely powerful force, the strongest of these four, but it has very short range. In fact, you can figure out the range approximately by looking at the radius or the diameter of the largest stable nucleus, and that about gives you the range of the strong force. Beyond that, you start adding in more neutrons or protons. The strong force can't quite keep things playing nicely as, as well as it could beforehand, then bam, you get some decays. So then, moving on from the quarks, uh, those are the things that give you nuclear matter. You have electrons. Those are what orbit the nuclei, the positive nuclei, to give you atoms. And the force carrier that mediates these interactions, that keeps the electrons bound to the nuclei, is the photon, a.k.a. light. Uh, so it's, in fact, light that keeps the nuclei and the electron bound together. Take some extra photons over here, and we can have atoms interact with one another to give us more complex chemicals. For example, caffeine is shown here. <laughs> 
And there you have it. The up quarks, down quarks, electrons, gluons, and photons make up pretty much everything that you're going to interact with the rest of today, and the day after that, and the day after that. So what about the rest of these particles? We have a bunch that I haven't even named yet. The charm, strange, top, and bottom quark. These extra leptons, the muon and tau, and the all-important neutrinos. And then these extra force carriers, the Z and the W. And then, of course, antimatter. I didn't mention any of that either. You're not going to encounter a lot of antimatter today. So what happened to all of these? At the beginning of the universe, right when it was a condensed ball of very, very hot matter, uh, all of these particles that you saw on this page, matter and antimatter, existed in pretty great abundance. But then the universe began to cool down over time. And uh, matter and antimatter, when you have a particle and its antiparticle interact with one another, they actually cancel each other out. They annihilate in the blast of light and photons. And so at the beginning of all things, it turns out that there was just slightly more matter as the universe began to cool down than there was antimatter. And this is the approximate stat for every 10 billion and one particles of matter, you had about 10 billion particles of antimatter. And so as the universe began to expand and these things were able to interact with one another, this slight asymmetry canceled out, leaving us with score matter one and antimatter zero. <laughs> so that's why we're all around today. And keep this in mind, because I'm not just mentioning this lightly. This is tied into the neutrino picture. In addition, as the universe cooled down, these heavier particles, like the charmed uh, mesons and the uh, mesons containing bottom quarks and muons and taus, these other more exotic particles, they were heavier. And uh, as the universe cooled down, it no longer had the energy needed to sustain these states reliably. And they began to decay away until all that we had left were these familiar lighter particles. What I'm showing you here is not just a particle decay. This is a simulated proton-proton collision at CMS, uh, producing, I think, a Higgs, uh, two Higgs particles. But all of that, all the really interesting physics with the exotic particles like Higgs, occurs in a tiny pinpoint right over here. And everything else that you're looking at are the lighter particles that those exotic particles decay off into, everything that the Higgs broke off into over here. And yes, there's some other debris from the proton-proton collision, but the important part is that what we register in all of our detectors even, when we're trying to look at these exotic states, is light, simple states, like protons, like electrons, like photons. Now there's a little bit of a disclaimer here as well. Muons, which are one of these more exotic states, can last long enough to escape from a detector. So a lot of the particles you're looking at here are probably muons. But ultimately those two will decay away into electrons and some neutrinos, and so you just have the normal matter that you're used to. So that's why we don't have antimatter, because it and matter basically completely canceled out, leaving a slight excess of matter. And we don't have these more exotic particles because they decay away. There's not enough energy to sustain them in the colder universe that we live in today. But there's a key point here when I talked about particles decaying, and that is that elementary particles aren't composed of anything smaller. If you think of a building decaying, you're probably imagining windows falling out or bricks crumbling. And that's not true for an elementary particle. There's nothing inside of it. It's a single self-contained unit. So they can't break apart when they decay. They, in fact, have to change identity into another type of particle and release any excess energy as other particles. So for example, a top quark can change identity into a bottom quark. A top quark is a little bit heavier than a bottom quark, so a little bit more unstable. And it's going to have to release a little bit of extra energy as well, because there's more mass in a top quark than a bottom quark. And you have to release that excess mass as energy, or in this case, as a combination of other particles and energy. And the only way that you can get this kind of identity swapping is through the weak force. Or the primary way to get this kind of identity swapping is through the weak force. And these are two of the force carriers that we didn't mention before, the Z and W boson. The one that's important for these identity changing operations is the W boson. So here, for example, what's actually happening in this picture where a top quark decays to a bottom is the top is flipped into a bottom quark and in the process releases an anti-electron neutrino and a positron. And it does so through this force carrier, through the W boson. And having a neutrino here isn't just coincidence. Neutrinos occur in basically all of these flavor changing um, all these identity changing weak interactions. Neutrinos are kind of the weak forces attendant. Uh, there are ways you can have this decay off into other things that aren't neutrinos. That's definitely possible, but neutrinos are an integral part of the weak force and its interactions. So if we go back to these, as you remember them from before, you can kind of look at matter as being made up of coin like particles. Okay, well, this is just these uh, 12 particles over here cast into coins instead. But each of these particles can be flipped into another type through a weak interaction. 
So the up quark, its identity can be changed into a down quark through the weak interaction. The charm into a strange, the top into a bottom. And then, here's where the neutrinos come in, electrons can be flipped into electron antineutrinos. That's the other side of that coin. Muons into muon neutrinos, and tau into tau neutrinos. And in fact, that's why we name them as such, because when an electron neutrino interacts in matter, it is often flipped into an electron. A muon neutrino is flipped into a muon. And so you can kind of look at matter as being coupled into these states that are bound by the weak force. It's also possible to have what are called cross-generational interchanges. So a strange quark can, in fact, be turned into an up quark, uh, but it's much less likely than simply occurring in these pairs that I've listed up above. Yes? <laughs> so uh, what caused them to flip would just be an interaction through this W boson mentioned before. Now, there are other types of interactions they could go through, and these are all probabilistic because it's a quantum effect. But if it occurs through the exchange of this W boson, it's possible to force one of these flips. Right. You're not at any great risk of this happening. Um, <laughs> but you act, there are measurable rates because when you have this kind of identity changing interaction, think of, for example, atoms that can change identity, like radioactive potassium for bananas. When that decays and turns into another particle, it's actually decaying through the weak force of one of its um, nucleons of changing type. So depending upon what part of you is radioactive, that would determine how much of you is going to flip identity at any one moment. Yes? Well, so maybe there isn't, and that's, that's a key point. But the idea is that every particle has an antiparticle in the standard model. Um, and what I'm going to touch on later on is that while we're, we pretty much, we positively ascertain that the electron is an anti-electron, a muon an anti-muon, it's actually possible that neutrinos are their own antiparticles. Anything else? Yes. Yes, they do. Good observation. <laughs> well, if there is, it's a question we need a theorist for. I'm not sure of what the underlying symmetry would be that enforces that. Um, but what we're going to see in just a little bit is, in fact, these flips generally happen in pairs in such a way that charges always converge, is conserved. I do want to point out, just to make sure I don't state something incorrectly, that radioactive nuclei decaying will cause some atoms within you to change identity. But you can actually force these weak interactions to occur through uh, neutrinos as well. If you were to sh shoot a beam of neutrinos into something, you can force the reactions to go in reverse. And we're going to touch on that in the next couple of slides. So as uh, touching on the point that you just made, uh, these interactions can't happen alone with any kind of you know, dark magic, you need a sacrifice to go with it. And so if you're changing the identity of an up quark into a down quark, in the process, you're going to need to change an electron into an electron neutrino, for example. So these always happen in pairs. And so uh, th this conserves charge, which might have been a concern previously. Uh, you can see over here, add it together, you have minus one third over here and minus one third there. Uh, but it also is part of the reason that neutrinos are very frequently involved in these interactions. Uh, they're something that are very, they're the only force they really interact with is the weak force. There's gravity as well, but in terms of strong electromagnetic and weak, the weak force is what it interacts with. And because it's often involved in these weak interactions, and because these weak interactions require two sets of swaps, um, electron neutrinos, are, and, or muon neutrinos, neutrinos in general, are very frequently involved. And you can use neutrinos to force these processes to go in reverse. If you look carefully over here, we had an up quark on the left side and a down quark on the right. Here, if we, we can actually cause an, anti, an electron neutrino to flip a down quark into an up, and in the process, the electron neutrino turns into an electron, instead of just having electron neutrino produced by this weak decay. And this is the basis of neutrino detector, detectors. We make a beam of neutrinos, we send it through a detector, and we look for cases where a, an invisible particle, basically, because electro, neutrinos don't interact with matter except for through this weak interaction, and again, to some much lesser degree gravity, we look for uh, a big dark detector where nothing's going on, nothing, 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 and then bam, all of a sudden we see the production of an electron where this electron neutrino was turned into an electron by the weak interaction. 
so yes, that, that's possible. You're saying a neutrino is produced, an electron neutrino is produced by this decay over here, and then it goes some distance through matter, and then it forces this interaction. That, that's possible. The thing is, these interactions are very, very rare. Um, the stat that people like to throw out is that you can have a neutrino pass through 50 light years of lead and not interact with it at all. So the odds of producing one and then having it interact in that same volume is very low. Uh, so in these interactions, and I think I mentioned this before, flavor states are named after the uh, particles that they're going to turn into. So this is a slide from Anna Shukraft's talk on June 16th, if you were at that. But the electron neutrino turns into electron, muon into muon neutrino into muon, and tau neutrino into tau. But what's really interesting about neutrinos is they can also just change their own identity without involving any other particles, without involving one of those coin-like flips. As they move through space, they can actually go through three possible identities, electron, muon, and tau. So if you started off with an electron neutrino, as it moves through space, it can turn into a muon neutrino or a tau neutrino when it next interacts with matter. And uh, this is kind of perplexing because there's no other particle like that. You can't take a proton and throw it off in some direction and then 10 minutes later expect that proton's going to be something else. Um, you know, these things are <laughs> pretty fundamental. So how is it that this particle can actually change from one type into another with no external interaction with another particle? Yes? Yes, both of those things. Both of those things. What can happen is there's something called the matter effect. Um, and it's when a beam of neutrinos passes through matter containing a lot of electrons. Uh, frequent interactions between the electron and the electron neutrino can actually kind of refresh the electron neutrino state. Um, so what will happen is basically the electron and neutrino will kind of brush up against one another, but without changing identity, without changing momentum or anything like that. They just kind of acknowledge each other's presence. And, <laughs> and in the process of doing that, the electron neutrino state can actually be a little bit enhanced as, as, a, as a beam of neutrinos goes through matter, uh, depending upon something called the mass hierarchy that we'll touch on in a little bit. And in terms of distance traveled, well, yes, that's just because there's a, a probability at any given moment that the electron neutrino will interact. And so the more, the more options you give it, the more opportunities, the li more likely it'll be that you force this interaction. Yes? Um, yes, absolutely. In fact, what we do uh, at Fermilab is we make a beam of mostly muon neutrinos. And then we take a look at um, what fraction of this beam here turns into muons, essentially, when it, hits, uh, when it hits a particle. And then we measure this beam again when it's 810 kilometers away in, uh, in Ash River, Minnesota. And then we again measure what fraction of the time does this beam give us an electron you know, or, or a muon. And we find that there is you know, a non-zero chance that some of these muon neutrinos now interact as electron neutrinos. And we know that because they produce electrons when they interact. So yes, it's observable. They're distinct in that sense. Um, but I should point out that they're a little bit blurred in another sense, because neutrino flavor states, and by that I just mean what type they are, electron, muon, or tau, are composed of different mass states. And I want to hang on this for a moment, because this is a key point. <laughs> when you're talking about any other particle, uh, so say a proton, for example, it has a certain mass associated with it, or a ping pong ball or a bowling ball, certain mass. And so if you gave it a push, that thing would move with some speed dependent on its mass, right? The ping pong ball with the same push would go much further and much quicker than the bowling ball would. That would go a little bit slower. But an electron neutrino or a muon or tau neutrino are actually composed of some combination of, ma of different mass states, which means that these different mass states would actually all move at different speeds after the same push. And this can cause the neutrino to actually kind of disassociate, in a sense, and separate out into these mass eigenstates. And I'm going to show you a slide on that in just a second. But the big point here is, remember, P is mv over here. So for the same P, the same impulse given to something, different masses will move at different speeds. But the muon neutrinos that we produce here, they only have one momentum we give them, yet three different masses, which means the masses are going to start to stagger as the neutrino moves through space. So let's go over this, because I think this is a very <laughs> important point to, to hang on for a little bit. Let's say we start off with a muon neutrino, because this is what the NUMI beam here at Fermilab 
is, is designed to make. Recall that particles are actually wave packets. All right? We're talking about quantum effects, very small things that act as waves instead of just particles, points in space. And this muon neutrino, for example, is a combination of mass eigenstates. And you can't quite see it here, but I have two different wave functions here, a red one and a yellow one. And I think I made the red one heavier. We'll see in just a second. But as this muon neutrino starts to move through space, yes, there we go, the red one, the heavier mass, the heavier uh, pro wave function, is going to start to lag behind the lighter one. And then sometime later, it's lagged behind further still. But the interesting thing is, eventually you're going to get to a point where, where they started off with peaks aligned to peaks and troughs of troughs. We'll get to that point again sometime later on. And so if we were to look at what are the odds that this thing over here interacts as a muon neutrino and gives us a muon at time one and time four, the odds are going to be a little bit similar. Uh, well, not a little bit, quite a bit similar, because we have wave functions that look mostly the same. There's some difference. You can see, the, still you can see a little bit of that yellow over there, which means we now have some chance of seeing an electron neutrino. But in fact, we have more of a chance of seeing a muon neutrino here. And in that sense, this muon neutrino has oscillated back into itself over time. If we were to look at this neutrino at times two or three, we would have some chance of seeing a muon neutrino and some of seeing an electron neutrino, just based upon how these waves interact with one another. And so this is the basis of neutrino oscillations, is that this difference in mass between the different states and the fact that every flavor state, so muon, electron, or tau, is a combination of these three mass states, allows the masses to stagger and interfere with one another to give us different odds of finding each flavor neutrino. Questions on this before I move on? Yes? No, the mass is not changing. There are three possible masses. And each one of those, e there's a, a wave function you can look at associated with each of those states. And those wave functions begin to separate. Does that about cover it? Or? OK, well, ask me again if it's still a, a concern. Yes? Okay. And, and so the mass of like an electron neutrino comes out and it interacts with mass with electrons. It reinforces its identity being an electron neutrino, correct? Right. So then in this case, if we have this particular neutrino being an electron or a muon neutrino, and we keep it and it keeps interacting with mass with electrons, this is somehow this time one, time two, time three, time four may be altered or shifted. Well, it, it's the the matter effect. I just want to stress that part. Up. No, it's all good. <laughs> But the idea is that uh, the, the net effect of the matter effect is to make the electron flavor um, much closer to being a mass eigenstate. So it almost becomes its own mass eigenstate, meaning that the whole wave function would move as one. It wouldn't start to separate out. OK? Yes? Well, it's, it's always going to be a combination of these three. I, I, you know, it's very difficult to get to a point where you have zero probability of one or the other, except right after its production. Um, but what it means is, let's, let's just pretend this, was a, this is an eigenstate that's separating out in a vacuum, for example. Right? We're seeing that this particular mix of muon and electron neutrino, right? this, as it moves through a vacuum, the states would start to stagger. The idea behind the matter effect is there is some state that, uh, well, the electron neutrino state, something much more electron neutrino-like, uh, the, would start to move as one, these two different contributions, instead of separating out. Now, I'm really glossing over the details of it, but that is the basic idea of it. Normally, these, ma these states that are not um, a mass eigenstate, I think it's a combination, like flavor eigenstates, will separate out as it moves through matter. But due to the matter effect, the electron neutrino state becomes more and more mass eigenstate-like. And there's some critical density you can get to of electrons. I'm not sure what it is. I'm not sure how feasible it is to attain it, where the electron neutrino would just move as a, as a mass eigenstate. It wouldn't start to separate out. So the more electrons you have, the closer you are to that state, the more that that electron eigenstate is, uh, the flavor eigenstate is closer to a mass eigenstate. Yes? Uh, but the muon neutrino does separate out. Well, I, yes. Yeah, in fact, in they're almost always going to separate out. Yeah. 
you might imagine some situation where there were a lot of muons somehow condensed in one place, and then maybe the muon uh, flavor state is closer to being a mass eigenstate. Um, first, yes? And then, so that would mean, to my question, that it would be sourcing out of the system. It would be simpler. I mean, all of these are in a vacuum are always going to start separating out like this. And it's just, if you were to have a high concentration of the flavor lepton that it turns into, then it becomes closer to that condition of the, of the matter effect, forcing that flavor eigenstate into a mass eigenstate. So if you were to get a whole bunch of taus and throw them together somehow, and they weren't decaying, <laughs> you, know, you could imagine making the tau closer to a mass eigenstate in that, in that regime, in that frame. OK. No, it's a different combination for each each flavor state. Yes. Yes. So is there any one set of conditions that dominates over the other? So if you had thirty three percent electron, thirty three percent muon, muon, thirty three percent tau, all within one area and then a neutrino flies through it. Is there one that dominates over the other? <laughs> I I don't want to say because I'm not sure. Um, I'm really not sure. In fact, maybe if I just go one slide further, here we go. This is why I'm not sure. Um, neutrino oscillations are described by a whole bunch of variables. And <laughs> the, the problem is that they all tend to be lumped up together. So this is just the rate at which a muon neutrino turns into an electron neutrino in some situation. And you can see there are a lot of terms involved. And they usually only appear in combination. And that's why I was referring to this as the neutrinonian knot here. Because to try to untangle it, we need to find some way to either solve them all at the same time, figure out the values of all of these variables at the same time or derive some kind of clever loophole. So I don't want to weigh in on that question because I'm really not sure. I'd have, to, I'd have to think about that. OK, yeah, one more. Yeah, one more. <laughs> you don't have to go back to what I think is the first slide slide two. Was the reason why you chose the quarter, the Minnesota quarter, because we're firing all those neutrinos from Minnesota? I did not make those pictures, actually, but I assume that's why. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I didn't even notice that. That's a good one. <laughs> Uh, so how can we break these terms apart and see what nature has to tell us? And there are three regimes that we're going to be covering in this talk. Uh, one is something called delta CP. That's a variable that is related to uh, the difference between how matter and antimatter interact with one another. Um, there's this theta 2, 3 variable. And what that's going to tell us is of one of these mass eigenstates, the third one, does it consist of more muon neutrino or more tau neutrino in terms of what combination composes it in some? We actually don't know the answer to that. And the other is of these three mass eigenstates, which one is the lightest and which one is the heaviest. Despite all we know about neutrinos, we don't actually know what the magnitude of their masses is. We don't know how large they are entirely and whether the third mass eigenstate is heavier or lighter than the first one. And these are some big problems, and we're not going to be able to solve all of these, <laughs> all of these uh, equations that we see. Or, well, we can solve these equations. We're not going to be able to differentiate all these contributions without knowing a little bit about all three of these. So, neutrino masses. We know there are three neutrino mass states, but there's a lot about them that's unknown. As just said previously, for one, we're not sure whether the third mass eigenstate is more muon or tau neutrino-like. And these are the ver values of theta 2, 3, this mixing variable that would tell us one or the other. And we're also not even sure what the masses of those states are. So how do we even start on that? Well, we don't even have to do some direct neutrino physics to figure this part out. Um, cosmologists can do quite a lot. And you can get an upper limit on the sum of the three neutrino masses at less than some fraction of an EV, an electron volt, uh, based on looking at the structure of the universe, <laughs> essentially. And by that I mean um, what kind of clumping occurs with matter as the universe begins to expand and as gravity exerts its influence on things. It turns out that for massive neutrinos, you're actually going to see fewer large-scale structures. The structure is going to be a bit more diffuse. And for massless neutrinos, the structures are much more condensed. The effect of the neutrinos is kind of spread things out that way. And so by looking at the degree to which these structures are diffuse, you can determine this value over here, the sum of the three neutrino masses, and find that it has to be something around that. I wouldn't take that too strictly, something around less than 0.3 eV. But this is weird, because that's very, very small compared to all the rest of the particles. The electron is the lightest particle up to the neutrinos, and the neutrinos are something like, here we go, six orders of magnitude smaller than the other elementary particles. That's absurd. That is <laughs> tremendously small. And so we have to ask ourselves if neutrinos even acquire mass in the same way as other particles do. Most particles, uh, most of the charged leptons, the, the 
the quarks get their mass from what's called a Yukawa coupling to the Higgs field. This sombrero over here is the standard picture or representation of the Higgs field that people like to throw out. The top quark, the positron, the bottom quark, so matter and antimatter, charged leptons and quarks all get their mass from this coupling to the Higgs field. Now it's called the Dirac mass, and the conceptual function of this is that neutrinos, uh, if we had a, a, a Dirac particle, like an electron, the electron and the anti-electron are not the same particle. They can't mix with one another as they move through space. Um, and if the neutrinos get their mass in the same way through this Yukawa coupling to the Higgs field, then neutrinos and antineutrinos also do not mix. They're not the same particle. But there are other ways to give particles masses. And you can have ways that involve the Higgs field or don't. And uh, there are, there's one way called a Majorana mass in which neutrinos and antineutrinos would be the same particle. They can um, mix with one another. And so if we were to find that neutrinos, again, with their oddly light masses, are not Dirac particles, but Majorana particles, then antineutrinos and neutrinos would be the exact same particle. And that has some very far-reaching effects. Now, given all of this, do neutrino masses follow expectation in other ways? For one, we know that the electron is lighter than the muon, is lighter than the tau. So maybe we expect that neutrinos follow some similar pattern, where the most electron-like neutrino mass eigenstate is the lightest, the one that has a little bit more muon and tau is going to be in the middle, and the one with the most muon and tau is going to be the heaviest. And that's called the normal hierarchy. And because normal, that's kind of what we would expect following trends from the past. But we haven't determined if this is true or not. And because we don't really know how the neutrino masses are generated, then perhaps the normal hierarchy does not hold. Perhaps we're looking at an inverted hierarchy where the third mass eigenstate, which is mostly mu and tau, is in fact heavier than the first and second mass eigenstates. And that's called the inverted hierarchy. And this is a pretty big unknown um, because figuring this out would tell us you know, quite a bit about how well we understand nature and the trends associated with it. That's called the mass hierarchy problem, or the mass ordering problem, after which the talk was named. And solving it would certainly help to untangle our knot. But um, finding a normal or inverted hierarchy also affects how we answer the Majorana versus Dirac question. Now, one way we can try to address this Majorana versus Dirac question is by looking for something called neutrinoless double beta decay. And remember, what we're talking about here with this question is, is a neutrino its own antiparticle? So over here, we've got a germanium nucleus at rest. The rest of the protons and neutrons are just out of perspective, let's say. I didn't want to copy and paste all of those. Now, neutrons can decay. In fact, in a vacuum, they decay in about 10 minutes, but bound to other particles, it takes them much longer. Uh, and they're, they're more stable inside of nuclei. Neutrons can decay into protons, blue to red over here, in the process releasing an antineutrino and an electron. That's a type of radioactive decay that's pretty popular. But also recall that a neutrino can convert a neutron into a proton. So a neutrino comes in, hits a neutron, turns that neutron into a proton, and it's flipped into an electron in the process. But just consider then the case that if a neutrino is its own antineutrino, we might see that a neutron decays to give us a proton and, a, and an electron and an antineutrino. But if that antineutrino interacts as a neutrino with this neutron over here, and then it's going to convert that into a proton, and we're going to get two electrons out of it. And this is what's called neutrinoless double beta decay, or zero nu beta beta. And the rate at which this occurs is proportional to a mass that's, it depends upon the masses of the mass eigenstates. It's actually a combination of the three mass eigenstates, how much each contributes to the electron flavor state. That's why it says MEE. So if we could pin down an upper limit or find exactly the rate at which neutrinoless double beta decay occurs, we can get some information on the possible masses of the neutrinos. You can also, as you might imagine, simply have two neutrons decay off independently of one another. In that case, there would also be two neutrinos in this picture. Neutrinos don't interact very readily. And so what that means is, in this case, the way you'd expect this picture to differ from the picture where there are also two neutrinos is there would be much less energy available, well, less energy available to the electrons in this case, because some of it was carried away by the electron neutrinos. Yes? Well, 
I don't know if we want to go with density. That's certainly a factor. Um, it's, you're right. It's very, very, very rare. Um, and that's why, to date, unless I missed something in today's purview of the archives, um, there, there has not been a confirmed observation of this neutrinoless double beta decay. It'd be very interesting if someone found it, because that would mean immediately that neutrinos are Majorana particles, or at least partly Majorana particles. Anything else? Yes. In the, the default standard model, that's the only particle that you have that's a Majorana particle. I'm positive that there exist theories out there in which other particles have Majorana counterparts, but not in the default standard model. Or this, this light extension in which we say that neutrinos have our Majorana particles. Um, also, another option is that a direct mass measurement could eliminate the inverted hierarchy option. Um, we actually know the magnitude of the difference between mass states 1 and 3. It's about 0.05 electron volts. So let's say we were to find that the mass of the lightest eigenstate was 0.03 electron volts. Well, that would mean that in the case of an inverted hierarchy, we'd have a neutrino mass eigenstate with a negative mass, which is just not physically possible. So right then and there, that could rule out the inverted hierarchy as an option. And uh, as I, I don't think I mentioned this on the previous slide, but the value of MEE, so again, this combination of mass states, also is going to affect the, uh, or is going to be affected by which mass hierarchy you're looking at. But it's not quite as clean cut as that. So by looking for this neutrinoless double beta decay or taking a direct mass measurement, we could try to rule out the inverted versus normal hierarchy. However, there's another fun thing that comes up if neutrinos have both, have not just Majorana or Dirac mass terms, but a combination of the two of them, both Majorana and Yukawa mass terms. In that case, it would actually lead to neutrinos with two masses, one of them being enormous and one of them being very small, and they'd be inversely related to one another. This is called the seesaw mechanism, and it says that each neutrino that we see is going to have a much heavier counterpart that existed early on in the universe. So the picture we'd be looking at in this case is that we had equal amounts of matter and antimatter in the early universe, because that's what a lot of theories predict. It should have been equal from the beginning. And so here we have our heavy neutrinos and just a bunch of positrons and electrons. Now, if uh, we, these, po these large heavy neutrinos would have decayed over time, remember, things that are heavy and exotic tend to decay as the universe cools down. There's not enough energy to sustain them. And uh, when they decay, uh, a good chance is that what they would decay into would be, in this case, say, um, an electron and a Higgs boson. Um, but the neutrino sector has something called a CP violating mechanism. And what that means is that when you're looking at interactions involving the weak force and neutrinos, matter and antimatter can interact differently. And so what we'll be talking about in this case is, let's say that this heavy neutrino, when it turns into an electron and a Higgs, um, it actually occurs at a different rate than it would turn into a positron and a Higgs. So this leads to something well, in a little second over here. So we might have more chances of this heavy neutrino turning into an electron than a positron. Recall, this is matter. That's antimatter. And so this leads to something called leptogenesis, in which these heavy neutrinos would give rise to more matter leptons than antimatter leptons. And that could explain why we see more matter today, that extra 1 in 10 billionth factor, um, than we see antimatter. And could explain why we, have, why we have this excess to begin with. Now, we don't just have an excess of leptons, of of positive normal matter, of normal matter leptons. We have an excess of baryons versus antibaryons as well. And that's taken care of through something called a Svaleron process, which allows part of this asymmetry to be converted into a quark anti quark asymmetry. And so it's possible that if we have this Majorana and Yukawa term mass generation for the neutrinos, that that is a candidate for why we ended up with just more matter today than antimatter, though at the beginning we would have expected both to be produced in equal quantities. So remember the term we're looking at to try to measure this is this CP violation. And in the light neutrino sector, there's also a CP uh, violation term. That's something called delta CP. You may have recalled that from the not picture earlier. So this is just a measure of how frequently an interaction involving an electron neutrino or a muon neutrino and its counterpart, the anti-electron or anti-muon neutrino, occur. 
And we're looking at, again, is a difference in the rates at which these interactions occur. And by comparing them, we can help determine what delta CP is for these lighter neutrinos. And this could be a bit of a window into whether it's even possible that we could get leptogenesis through the decay of the heavier neutrinos. Any questions? Yes? It would be a cosmology idea, and I am no expert on that. Um, that's right. That's absolutely right. You look for the remnants. I mean, my first guess would be it's looking at the amount of, of uh, the amount of light you have, how much energy is stored as light, because that's what they annihilate into. But I don't know. A fun thing about a lot of these measurements is they are indirect. You can't actually find the source. Like, for example, these heavy neutrinos, we're not going to produce them. We're talking about enormous masses, way outside Large Hadron Collider. So you need to be a little bit more subtle about how you find them. It's a lot of fun. Um, so uh, this actually ties into your question, so good call. Uh, theories that seek to explain something called unification often rely on a certain regime of neutrino parameters. So for example, normal or higher normal or inverted hierarchy, a certain value of delta CP. What I mean by unification is, uh, back at the very beginning, at the Big Bang, the four fundamental forces are believed to have all been a single force, meaning equal in strength and how they interact with things, that eventually kind of settled out and condensed into four individual forces as the universe cooled down. So we go from this single theoretical unified force down to having gravity, a strong force, and then weak and electromagnetic forces. Um, so determining what regime in the weak sector in neutrinos actually describes our reality can help to narrow down which of these theories are valid because a lot of them make an assumption of one option being true or the other. And so we can shed light not only on the matter-antimatter asymmetry, but perhaps even on which theories could describe the origin of the universe by pinning down some of these variables. So how do we actually measure these? Well, solar and reactor neutrino experiments have already made an enormous amount of, pro of progress in terms of pinning down neutrino oscillation parameters. I haven't even spoken about a number of them today because there are a lot of them and because they've been very well pinned down. There's an angle called theta 1, 3. Again, these all describe the rate at which neutrinos oscillate into one another, the flavor states they move through space. Um, that has been pinned down extremely well by reactor experiments, which look at anti-electron neutrinos produced by nuclear decays inside of nuclear reactors. Then solar neutrinos take a look at electron neutrinos being produced by the sun, taking values of these two other uh, angles over, these two other oscillation parameters over here. And that's something to think about if you haven't. Uh, the sun is fueled by burning hydrogen and turning it into helium. And in the process, you have protons converted into neutrons, and these identity-changing operations very frequently give you a neutrino, and certainly that operation does, that fusion of hydrogen to helium. So a huge number of neutrinos are given off by the sun every second. Just an enormous number. And uh, a lot of these solar neutrino experiments can start looking at them. And based on what we know about the sun and how far away the sun is from Earth, we can try to figure out a little bit about oscillations from electron neutrinos into other states. Now, these types of experiments have made measurements of other neutrino oscillation properties as well. I'm not trying to downsell them here. <laughs> They've done a fantastic job. But right now, we're aiming with long baseline experiments at accelerators to kind of just finish this off and finally figure out what's going on with neutrinos. In general, the structure of these accelerator-based long baseline experiments is to create a beam of muon neutrinos and send it through the Earth. And in transit, this beam is going to become a mix of different neutrino flavors. Because remember, the flavor states will separate out. So we start off with muon neutrinos. We end up with different mass eigenstates. And the muon neutrinos can change identity. We have near and far detectors. Uh, this, by the way, is a cartoon from Dune, which is set to begin construction in, in the near future and will be a long baseline neutrino experiment. Um, we measure what fraction of the beam is muon, or give, interacts as muon and electron neutrinos at the near detector. We do the same at the far, and we can compare these rates to determine likely values of this parameter over here, delta M32, theta 23, which remember it gives us some information on whether the third state is more muon or tau like and delta CP, why are matter and antimatter, why do they behave differently, and how differently do they behave. Um, this value over here is actually also related to that inverted versus normal hierarchy question. 
If we could pin down the sign of it, if we know that this were positive or negative, that would tell us whether we're looking at a normal or inverted hierarchy. We do the same thing for beams of antineutrinos. Um, so we can kind of reverse the current on the horns we use to focus our particles and end up producing a beam of antineutrinos as well. And we then perform the same measurement. We look at rates in the near detector and the far detector. How often did the beam interact as an anti-electron neutrino or anti-muon neutrino? And compare them to get further restrictions on these variables. And in fact, that's kind of the loophole by which we can try to cut through a lot of this knot at the same time. What I'm going to show you here is a simulation of possible uh, observations that NOVA can make, which is one of these long baseline neutrino experiments. Over here on the right axis, we're saying, what kind of rate do we observe muon neutrinos turning into electron neutrinos? And on the y-axis, anti-muon neutrinos turning into anti-electron neutrinos. Now, on these contours, what we're looking at are possible values that we could observe, okay, based upon whether we're looking at a normal mass hierarchy, the blue, or an inverted mass hierarchy, the red. So you can see that normal versus inverted masses will give us different probabilities. And whether we're looking at the third state being more muon neutrino-like or tau neutrino-like, we'll separate these contours out in a different direction. Finally, delta CP, that how to matter and antimatter behave differently, will help us move around this contour. And so we can explore a lot of possible options over here as to what the, how these probabilities are affected by all three of these variables that we're trying to determine the values of. So if nature is kind to us, perhaps we end up finding that this is, in fact, the value in parameter space that we're looking at. And if that were the case, then with a single pair of measurements of nu mu to nu e and nu mu bar to nu e bar, we'd be able to determine quite a lot all at once. We'd know the mass hierarchy with good precision. Here, in this case, it would be a normal mass hierarchy. we know that the CP violation term is something around maximal. And we know that, meaning the most different that matter and antimatter could be in terms of these interactions. And we know which quadrant um, theta 2, 3 falls into, or of this third mass state is a more tau or muon-like. Now, it could be that nature is unkind, and we end up with a spot right over here in the center, which would tell us almost nothing. But <laughs> we're, we're hopeful that we do, in fact, have something that we'll be able to observe and then knock out three of these all at once. So if we were to combine results of many different experiments, you know, for example, we can take a look at nu-mu to nu-e analyses and nu-mu bar to nu-e bar analyses. We can take a look at what these reactor and, and the solar neutrino experiments have already told us. And if we throw all of it together, ideally, we'll be able to soon figure out all three of these, the three ans answers to all three of these problems, basically. How do neutrinos and antineutrinos interact differently? And what does that tell us about the possibility of the past and the origin of the universe and why we have more matter and antimatter? We'll be able to tell whether this third eigenstate is heavier or lighter than the other eigenstates. Uh, we might expect, again, naively, that since it's more muon and tau-like, it's heavier, but maybe that's not true. Um, and uh, beyond that, you know, there may be something else waiting for us. We really don't know. Uh, because neutrinos have been very mysterious so far. The standard model, by default, tells us they shouldn't even have masses. So the fact that they do right away is interesting. And uh, if we take this further, we could find out a whole lot. So we have time for questions, but I actually had a slide on this matter effect. So I just want to go through it briefly, <laughs> if you'd like. <laughs> um, so basically what happens is you have this beam that's composed of electron, muon, and tau. And well, it starts off as a muon neutrino, right? But the mass eigenstates begin to separate out. And so now you have a chance of observing it as a muon neutrino or a tau neutrino, OK? Um, the idea is that this electron neutrino fraction of that beam can actually interact with electrons through this interaction shown here. This is a Feynman diagram of the interaction. And that has the effect of kind of refreshing the new E component of the beam. It's always being recognized as existing and being forced back into place by this exchange over here, by this interaction between electron and new E. And again, as I was saying before, at a high enough density, it would actually become a mass eigenstate. It would be refreshed so often, in a sense that it would just travel unimpeded, not unimpeded, it would travel without oscillating through matter. Yes? Matter effect. 